Confidential Book 4051-31 U-570 Interrogation of Crew October 1941 Naval Intelligence Division Admiralty SW-1 The following report is compiled from information derived from prisoners of war. The statements made cannot always be verified. They should therefore not be accepted as facts unless they are definitely stated to be confirmed by information from other sources. Table of Contents Section 1. Introductory Remarks Section 2. Remarks on Crew of U-570 Section 3. Early History of U-570 4. First and Last Crews of U-570 5. Capture of U-570 6. Details of U-570 7. Diesel Electric Propulsion 8. Degaussing 9. Other U-Boats 10. U-Boat Construction 11. Third U-Boat Flotilla 12. U-Boat Executive Officers 13. U-Boat Bases and Depot Ships 14. Cooperation between U-Boats and Focke-Wulf Condor Aircraft 15. U-Boat Secret Orders 16. General Remarks Regarding U-Boats 17. Other Ships 18. Miscellaneous Appendix List of Crew of U-570 Interrogation of Crew of U-570, a 500-ton U-Boat, captured on 27th August 1941 in position approximately 62 degrees by 10 north and 18 degrees by 43 west. Section 1. Introductory Remarks U-570 is the first U-boat to be captured in this war, and her sighting and capture bringing great credit on the Navy and the Royal Air Force. Since the U-boat has now been commissioned under the name HMS Graf, and has been examined by technical experts, it has been considered unnecessary to include in this report any detailed description of the vessel. Embodied in this report is some general information obtained from prisoners from U-501 as well as from U-570. Section 2. Crew of U-570 The complement of U-570 consisted of four officers, three chief petty officers, eleven petty officers, and twenty-five ratings, making a total of forty-three. The inexperience of this crew was most striking, the engineer officer, one or two petty officers and one rating, being the only men to have taken part in a war cruise prior to U-570's first and last cruise. The chief petty officers were men who had been in the Navy for a number of years, the chief quartermaster having joined in about 1926. The average length of service of the petty officers was three and a half years, while only one rating had more than 18 months' service. About half of the ratings, all very young, joined the Navy in April 1940, and over half more recently than that date. Most of the technical ratings had done three to six months U-boat training, the seamen even less. The chief petty officers, and to a lesser extent some of the petty officers, expressed great concern at the inadequacy of the training and the lack of U-boat experience, not only of the men, but also of the officers and petty officers. No attempt was made to disguise the incompetence of the crew, and the officers were severely criticized by all the men. The impression gained was that the morale of the ratings was high at first, as they had been filled with clever propaganda about the glamour of belonging to the crew of a U-boat, and that they had little or no realization of active service conditions. Many were helplessly seasick, and at the first sign of real action, they gave way to panic and became useless, admitting later that they were, in point of fact, glad to be out of the war. 
They were somewhat childish in many ways, and appeared to have forgotten their recent escape from death, as they became interested in and curious about their immediate future prospects. The senior petty officers, having been somewhat depressed from the outset, and consequently of lower morale, would have been prepared to put up more of a fight had they any confidence in their captain or other officers. The chief quartermaster, by far the most competent man on the U-boat, appeared to have been systematically overworked for many months. He complained that he had only been home on leave once since the outbreak of the war. Like all German prisoners of war captured for many months, they were extremely security conscious as a result of repeated lectures on the attitude to be adopted if taken prisoners. The success of this measure has reduced the information obtained from prisoners and has made interrogation very much more difficult. Prisoners were surprised at the quantities and varieties of food in Great Britain. They admitted that the German blockade could not be anything like as effective as they had been led to believe by their own propaganda. In September 1939, Prisoners captured in the early days of the war felt sure that they would be home again by Christmas after a short and victorious war. A year later, quite a large proportion of prisoners captured in the summer of 1940 also expressed the opinion that Germany would have won the war by the end of that year. A few of the more optimistic men from U-570 hoped that the war would be over by the summer of 1942 they felt sure that Germany would win in the long run. The officers and petty officers made little effort to refute the charge that the U-boats had not achieved the desired success. Their obvious disappointment in the activities of the German Navy constituted a tacit admission of failure. Nevertheless, they defended Witz Admiral Vice Admiral Dönitz commanding U-boats as being the one man of enterprising, vitality, and independence of mind among the hide-bound, traditional, and obsolete officers of the naval high command. The captain, Captain Lieutenant, Lieutenant Commander Hans Ramlo, aged nearly 32 years, was a native of the Isar Valley and joined the Navy in 1928. He had served in surface craft, notably in e-boats, and had specialized in gunnery and coastal defense. He was stated to have only recently transferred to U-boats, and had commanded a training U-boat in the Baltic for a short time, U-570 being his first active service command in that branch of the Navy. He is married and has a small daughter. He appeared to have been somewhat of a disciplinarian, but was at first quite popular with his crew of young recruits, Later, many of the ratings joined in a chorus of criticism. The first lieutenant, Oberleutnant zur See Lieutenant Bernhard Bernd, aged 25 years, entered the Navy in 1935 and served in destroyers until transferring to U-boats some months ago. He was an uninteresting, arrogant young man and professed some contempt for the slackness and credulity of the British. According to the ratings of U-570, Bernd was a difficult and nagging superior, but neither efficient nor knowledgeable. His views on obligation, promises, or keeping faith were exactly what would have been expected of a rather typical product of the Nazi system. On the night of 18th, 19th October, 1941, Bernd attempted to escape from his prisoner of war camp and was shot dead. The junior officer, Lieutenant Zerzi, Sub-Lieutenant Walter Christiansen, 41 years of age, of Hamburg, joined the Navy in 1938. After various courses of instruction, he was sent to the mine layer Kaiser at Wilhelmshaven and denied that his ship had ever laid mines during his period of service on board. Towards the end of 1940, he volunteered for U-boats and did a shortened course. He was then appointed to U-570. He was very junior, having been granted his commission in the spring of this year, and hopelessly inexperienced. He behaved rather like a schoolboy, and was simple, cheerful, and not very intelligent. 
but a much more pleasant personality than any of the other officers of his U-boat. The engineer officer, Lieutenant Engineer, Engineer Sub-Lieutenant Erich Menzel, promoted from the lower deck on 1st January 1940, was 36 years of age and had joined the Navy on 1st October 1934. He was a man of considerable experience and had served in peacetime and on active service in other U-boats. Personally, he was a vulgar little Saxon with an appalling accent, but an enviable flow of invective. The officers and men of U-570 all realized that they would be court-martialed by the German naval authorities at the end of the war. The more thoughtful men feared that their punishment might be hard. But they all assumed that Romlo's fate would be a most unenviable one. Section 3. Early History of U-570 U-570, a 500-ton U-boat, type 7C, was built at Blom and Voss Yards, Hamburg. It may be presumed that she was laid down during the latter half of 1940. It was stated by prisoners that between three and five other U-boats were built simultaneously on the same slip with U-570. U-570 was apparently nearing completion early in March 1941 for prisoners have revealed that at the time the first officer, Lieutenant Engineer, Engineer Sub-Lieutenant Erich Menzel, and two or three engine room chief petty officers were then present in the U-boat attending the final stages of construction. From March 1941 onwards, petty officers and ratings began to arrive in the batches for Barbelerong, constructional training. It is not known at what stage the captain joined the ship. From a captured diary belonging to an officer prisoner, it appears that various tests of unspecified instruments were carried out in April 1941. U-570 was stated to have been launched on or about 15th April 1941 and was docked on the following day. Those of the U-Boat's company already drafted to the ship received training in security-mindedness and conduct while ashore on 16th April 1941. The diary mentioned above conveyed the impression that some members of U-570's crew attended a training course in torpedo firing and loading at Wilhelmshaven at 25th April 1941. Torpedoes were taken aboard. U-570 was commissioned on 15th May 1941 and was allocated to the 3rd U-Boat Flotilla. According to prisoners, U-570 left Hamburg on 17th May 1941 and proceeding alone through Kiel Canal, reached Kiel on the following day. An entry in a captured notebook alleged that Air Bottle Group 4 was leaking on this day. In Kiel, U-570 was taken over by officers of the U-Boat Acceptance Commission, who were to supervise working up and trials. These officers, who wear silver instead of gold braid, included Captain Zersi Fask, Captain Lieutenant Engineer Duden, Captain Lieutenant Engineer Kalb, Marine Baumeister Kerlene, Marine Engineer Erdmann. In addition, two further ratings joined the U-Boat, and also a fitter from the Blom and Voss Yard. U-570's trials with the U-Boat Acceptance Commission's representatives on board began on 22nd May 1940. On the previous day, according to a diary, there had already been a short diving test from 0930 to 0943, and two further men, one engineer petty officer second class and one stoker third class, joined the ship. On 22nd May 1941, there were trimming trials and diving tests between 10.35 and 12.22 hours. On 23rd May 1941, according to a diary, representatives of the Torpedo Versuchsdeptalon, or Torpedo Testing Department, came on board. These included Engineer Krollmann and Torpedo Mechanicians Gom, Zon, and Hartwig. The diary states, that diving was carried out between 08.20 and 10.05 hours, 
and that the U-boat lay on the bottom at a depth of 10.5 meters, 35 to 45 feet. On 24th May 1941, Engineer Krollman was again on board, and diving was carried out between 0800 and 0822 hours, and 1045 and 1152 hours. It is stated that dummy torpedoes were fired from the bottom. It is possible that during these torpedo tests, U-570 proceeded as far as Gothenhafen, the name of this port being entered in another diary belonging to an officer prisoner against the date of 24th May 1941. It appears, however, that U-570 had returned to Kiel by 26th May 1941, for a diary states that on 26th May 1941, new members of the U-Boat Acceptance Commission came on board, including Staff Chief Mechanician Bruns, Engineer Schönherr, and leading stoker named Eilers. There was diving practice between 0825 and 0831 hours, 1255 and 1330 hours, and 1340 and 1350 hours. On 27th May 1941, there was a pressure test in dock attended by a naval representative whose name is given in the diary as Cog. There was also diving between 0855 and 1335 hours. According to a diary, U-570 was at sea on 30th May 1941 with representatives of the U-Boat Acceptance Commission, the Torpedo Testing Department, and Engineer Nagel of the Barrage Trial Commission. The U-Boat dived between the hours of 0832 and 0941, and also carried out practice shooting at mines. On 31st May 1941, trimming trials were carried out, again with officers of the U-Boat Acceptance Commission who were reinforced on this occasion by Commander Schriner and Marine Waffen Officer, Naval Armament Officer, and Staff Chief Mechanician Bruns. U-570 dived between 0945 and 1045 hours. On 3rd June 1941, a diary states, U-570 took fuel on board. On 6th June 1941, hydrophone and underwater telephony tests were carried out submerged, which were attended by officers of the NEK, Nachrichten Eprobungskommission, Signal Tests Committee, including Captain Kopman, engineers Begier and Spitzek, presumably hydrophone experts of the U-Boat Acceptance Commission, and two men named Heller and Probst of the NEK. U-570 submerged between 11.05 and 12.01 hours, and between 13.17 and 14.27 hours. A diary states that on 7th June 1941, torpedo firing practice was carried out, U-570 diving between 1634 and 1730 hours. There is no indication in the diary as to where this took place, but one prisoner stated during interrogation that such practice was carried out off the Baltic port of Varnamunde. Similar tests were apparently carried out on the following day, 8th June 1941, and U-570 dived between 0812 and 0903 hours. It appears from another diary and from prisoners' statements that on this day and during the night of 9th June, U-570 also made a speed trial to Rune on the island of Bornholm and back. A diary stated that there were tests and practice dives on the two following days, 9th and 10th June 1941. The diary added that torpedo firing practice again took place on 13th and 14th June and was again attended by experts. It would appear from diaries and from prisoner statements that U-570 then returned to Hamburg to refit. On 18th June 1941, torpedoes were again taken on board according to an officer prisoner's diary. Towards the end of June, or at the beginning of July, U-570 again left Hamburg for Kiel, where she lay at Deutsche Werft on 5th July 1941, she was visited here by a number of engineers. 
On this day, she made a trial run, diving between 1454 and 1549 hours. Later, on 7th July 1941, provisions and ammunition were taken on board. On 8th July 1941, there were further hydrophone tests and three distance-finding apparatus specialists were on board. On this day, there were also trimming trials, the U-boat diving between 1345 and 1504 hours. A diary states that on 9th July, oxygen was taken on board, and final trimming trials were held at 13.30 before U-570 left Kiel for Varnamunde, possibly to carry out further torpedo firing trials. On 11th July 1941, the inflatable rubber life-saving rafts were tested as a preliminary for putting to sea on a longer cruise, and at 0500 hours on 12th July 1941, after explosive charges had been fixed in position, U-570 left Kiel for Horten in Oslo Fjord, and it is known that U-501 left Kiel for Horten on the same day, accompanied by a 500-ton U-boat whose identity number was not known. It seems possible that this was U-570. The following general details of trials and the training of the crew up to this period have been disclosed during interrogation of prisoners. Throughout trials, and indeed until U-570 left Trondheim to start her war cruise proper, officers of the U-Boat Acceptance Commission were virtually in control, and Captain Lieutenant Ramlo, though on board, did not assume command. Prisoners stated that U-570 did not make any extensive tactical trials with other U-Boats. Trials consisted of crash diving, gunnery, torpedo firing, and maneuvering in restricted waters. Gunnery trials were carried out at cruising speed with 8.8 centimeter gun, which had a crew of seven ratings. While in Kiel, the crew of U-570 lived in a ship named Ubena, a 9,600 ton liner of the Deutsche Ostafrika line. During the whole of her journey to Horten, U-570 proceeded on the surface, arriving on 13th July 1941 when she took practice torpedoes on board. The object of the visit to Horten was to continue trials through a period of eight days. During this time, on 16th and 17th July, U-570 made a short excursion to Oslo, returning to Horten. Prisoners stated that they were accommodated in barracks ashore at Horten, but that they were out every day practicing diving and maneuvering. U-570 was said to have left Horten on 20th or 21st July 1941 for Trondheim. It was during this visit that the crew had their first taste of excitement. Prisoners stated that when the U-boat was cruising between Bergen and Alisson, a British aircraft dived out of the sky and bombed a Norwegian ship lying about six or seven miles away from them. They believed the aircraft was too busy to see their U-boat, but they immediately crash-dived and in doing so touched bottom and struck a reef. This damaged the bows, a hydroplane, and the cap of torpedo tube number three, Mundungsklappe, besides wrecking their detector gear. Prisoners stated that they remained submerged after this incident for between 30 and 45 minutes, but not having heard any bombs being dropped, they surfaced again and put into a small remote harbor for the night. In this harbor, they found the Norwegian ship which had suffered damage about the bridge and had one wounded Norwegian on board. Prisoners did not know whether the Norwegian was acting as escort for the U-boat or whether the two ships had met by chance encounter. U-570 arrived off Trondheim on 25th July 1941 and put into Lo Fjord, about 13 miles north of the port. At Trondheim, it was decided that the U-boat must be thoroughly examined, and some time was wasted as another U-boat was occupying the only available dock. U-570 was moved to Jorahaven, the crew being accommodated in the depot ship Huascara. During this period, an attempt was made to repair damage below water by a petty officer telegraphist using life-saving apparatus. 
the petty officer has stated that he volunteered for the job as the remainder of the crew were too unskilled to be entrusted with the task. He remained over half an hour underwater, coming up on one or two occasions for additional oxygen. He succeeded in sawing away a steel rod which had fouled a hydroplane. When U-570 was docked, damage to the bows was repaired by welding steel plates, but it was not found possible to repair the detector gear as there was no engineer at Trondheim who understood the work. U-570 was therefore unable to use this apparatus during her war cruise. Prisoners criticized this state of affairs bitterly and stated that owing to the rapid expansion of the U-boat arm, there were no longer enough skilled technicians to meet requirements. Repairs having been completed, further trials were carried out. These apparently consisted chiefly of diving, maneuvering, and gunfiring practice. Representatives of the U-Boat Acceptance Commission were still on board, and U-570 was apparently not finally handed over to Captain Leutnant Ramlo until the middle of August. On 22nd August, the eve of the start of U-570's first and last war cruise, the pending departure was celebrated on board while the U-boat was lying in low fjord. Much wine and beer flowed, and the entertainment consisted of songs and recitations. The hit of the evening was a long recitation containing personal details of U-570's officers and other members of the crew, as well as descriptions of the U-boat's trials. This frivolous extravaganza, preserved apparently for purely sentimental reasons, provided the British interrogating officers with useful information. It might well serve as a warning against the preservation of personal records, however harmless they may appear by the ship's companies of all sailing vessels and waters in which they are liable to capture. Q-570, then being ready for sea, electric war torpedoes were taken on board. Of these, four were stated to have been stowed in the bilges forward and one in the bilges aft, five in the tubes, two on the floor plates, and two in containers on the upper deck. Some prisoners, however, denied that torpedoes were in the containers on the upper deck. U-570 provisioned for a cruise of about four weeks. Section 4, First and Last Cruise of U-570 U-570 left Low Fjord for her first and last war cruise at 0800 on 24th August 1941. She was probably accompanied to sea by U-568, then stated to have been at Trondheim, and was escorted to the North Sea by a trawler. U-570 was apparently under instructions to proceed to the Atlantic south of Iceland, carry out attacks, and then to make for La Palisse on the French Atlantic coast. Few things appear to have gone well on this cruise for the U-boat and her inexperienced crew. Soon after leaving harbor, engine trouble developed. It was found that the valves of one of the diesel engines were not securely seated and because of this, the cooling system did not work properly, resulting in severe overheating. Repairs were effected while the U-boat proceeded on one engine. No sooner had this trouble remedied than the further difficulties developed with the injector pumps. In addition, U-570 was making a certain amount of water through one of her torpedo tubes, an old trouble which it was thought had been checked, and also through an exhaust pipe. According to one prisoner, U-570 twice sighted aircraft while crossing the North Sea and crash-dived on each occasion. Another prisoner stated, however, that no aircraft were seen. It appears that the U-boat proceeded mostly on the surface to her area of operations, which, there is some reason to believe, was designated by the codeword Rosengarten. Her approximate course was north of the Shetlands, north of the Faroe Isles, to a position south of Iceland. She sighted three drifting mines off Iceland, believing them to be German. According to a diary, she sighted a steamer on 25th August 1941 and a second on 26th August 1941 when she submerged, but on neither occasion did she attack. 
During this part of the cruise, U-570 was in constant touch with Vice Admiral U-boats, and prisoners stated that on one occasion they received a signal saying that a U-boat had sunk four ships out of a convoy protected by American destroyers. The signal attributed this success to the lack of experience of the Americans. The encouraging effect of this signal on the crew of U-570 was said to have been considerable. On the night of 26-27 August 1941, they received another message that a U-boat had sunk a ship in their vicinity. Prisoners stated that U-570 was also informed of an approaching convoy which had been sighted and was being shadowed by another U-boat. Acting upon orders, U-570 left her operational area to proceed to intercept this convoy when disaster overtook her. According to one prisoner, 10 to 12 U-boats had gathered in the vicinity of U-570, all having designs on the same convoy. They had come from various flotillas and bases. U-570 received orders to attack the convoy, but these were cancelled and a more northerly course ordered, owing to an alteration of course by the convoy. It appears that the other U-boats were in a more favorable position for the attack. Prisoners stated that they expected to attack the convoy on 28th August, that is to say 24 hours after the time of their detection and capture. Section 5. Capture of U-570 At approximately 8.30 on the morning of 27th August 1941, U-570 submerged in position about 62 degrees 15 north and 18 degrees 35 west to obtain some respite from heavy seas which had already caused much seasickness among her inexperienced crew. At 10.50 the captain decided to surface again and brought the U-boat up from a depth of approximately 90 feet. What happened next can only be attributed to the lack of training of the commander. Romlo entirely forgot to make any observation for hostile aircraft before exposing his ship. It so happened that a Hudson Aircraft S belonging to 269th Squadron and piloted by Squadron Leader Thompson was almost immediately overhead. U-570 perceived her danger too late and while she was attempting to crash dive, the aircraft dropped a stick of four 250-pound depth charges at an angle of 30 degrees to the U-boat's track. These exploded close to her, the nearest being about 10 yards away. One minute after the water disturbance had subsided, U-570 surfaced again, bow down, and 10 to 12 of her crew came on deck. The aircraft attacked with guns, until a white flag was waved from the conning tower. It was established by interrogation of prisoners that, at the moment of the attack, confusion reigned within the U-boat. The detonation of the depth charges, the smashing of instruments, the formation of gas, thought by the crew to be chlorine gas, and the entry of a certain amount of water apparently convinced Ramlo that his boat was lost for he ordered the crew to don life jackets and mount the conning tower. Prisoners stated that once on deck, it became necessary for them to wave the white flag, as it was possible that the aircraft, imagining that they were about to man their gun, might have attacked once more. Seas were apparently so high that the manning of the gun was out of the question, as also was the launching of a boat, and no one among the crew relished the prospect of being cast into the seas, when not a single ship was in sight. Huddled in their miserable position, the crew remained throughout the day. At 1345, the Lockheed aircraft was relieved by a Catalina flying boat, which, like its predecessor, proceeded to circle the U-boat with its guns trained on the crew. As the day drew on, U-570's officers seemed to have regained some of their composure, and a number of men re-entered the U-boat. A wireless signal was sent informing the Vice Admiral U-boats that the U-boat could no longer submerge and that she had been captured. After this, 
Unskilled attempts were made with a hammer to smash vital and secret mechanisms. Confidential papers were dumped over the side, and the cipher machine was broken to pieces and also dumped. Water was rising in the control room, and after working the electric pumps, current ran low and the lighting failed. The forward compartments were shut off because of leakage. At 2250, the aircraft and U-570 were sighted by His Majesty's trawler Northern Chief. This vessel closed the U-boat and made the following signal. If you make any attempt to scuttle, I will not save anyone and will fire on your raft and floats. The reply was made, I cannot scuttle or abandon. Save us tomorrow, please. The U-boat was then ordered to show a small white light to ensure that contact might be maintained, and this was fitted aft. The crew of U-570 were still apparently anxious about their fate and began to jettison ammunition and provisions in order to lighten ship. Many of the men appeared to have gone below to recover their most precious possessions, and one or two prisoners have stated that they actually slept below on this night. At 0330, HMT Kingston Agate arrived on the scene and was instructed to sweep the east of U-570 while HMT Northern Prince swept to the west. At 0550, His Majesty's ships Burwell, Waswater, and Windermere arrived and asked for the position of the U-boat. Heavy seas were running, making towing operations impossible at that hour. At 0805, a single-engine float plane was seen to approach U-570 and drop bombs, then making for Northern Prince, who opened fire owing to the hostile appearance of this aircraft. Firing ceased immediately as recognition marks were seen. As a result of this bombing, Romlo reported that U-570 was making water aft, but this was disbelieved as she did not change her trim, which was down by the bows. Continual complaints were now, however, made by U-570's crew, who said they were unable to keep their vessel afloat and asked to be saved. This was promised them, only provided they kept their ship afloat. At 0720, U-570 offered to take a tow, and at 0802, HSCS Niagara arrived. At 0835, a line was passed from Burwell to U-570. Windermere assisted by lying to windward and pumping oil. At 0915, this line parted owing to the unmaneuverability of Burwell and U-570's crew being unable to haul in the line from their conning tower, their upper deck being awash. HMS Windermere then attempted to take the U-boat in tow three times, but all attempts were unsuccessful. At 10.30, as U-570 was slowly settling by the head, the continuous signals were being received from her that she could not remain afloat much longer. She was ordered to blow more ballast, if necessary, pump out oil. It appeared that no effort was being made by the crew, so a burst was fired from Burwell's starboard 0.5 machine gun over the conning tower. Unfortunately, owing to the laboring of the two vessels, some of the bullets hit the conning tower, wounding five of the crew. This action greatly perturbed the U-boat's crew, and once more the white flag was in evidence. It did, however, have the desired effect. Oil and water were blown out, and for the first time, U-570 appeared to be in full surface trim. At 10.35, His Majesty's trawler Kingston Agate reported that she was fitted for towing and was given permission to try. At 13.50, two officers and two ratings from Kingston Agate boarded U-570 by Carly float, and the wounded men were taken off. At 14.02, HMT Kingston Agate reported all confidential books and instruments destroyed, and that U-570 was filling with chlorine. Prisoners stated that the formation of gas within the U-boat had been considerably aggravated by the second bombing attack upon them. At 1600, U-570 
was got in tow stern first by HMT Kingston Agate and the crew were being removed. At 19.30 the tow parted and HMT Kingston Agate proceeded to Reykjavik with the wounded. At 20.57 U-570 was finally taken in tow by His Majesty's trawler Northern Chief and brought successfully to Thorlekshofen where she was beached. Examination of U-570 has shown that a moderately well-trained crew should have had no difficulty in diving the U-boat. Lieutenant George Colvin, Royal Navy, who inspected U-570 reported that the pressure hull appeared to be undamaged and that no leaks could be found. The forward main ballast tanks was holed and gave no buoyancy. The remainder of ballast tanks were probably undamaged but may have had slow leaks due to strained joints in pipe connections to tanks. The four planes were almost certainly out of action. There were small quantities of water in the forward compartment, the control room, and the engine room, but scarcely more than would normally accumulate in the bilges. Internally, the damage was negligible and consisted mostly of a few broken gauges, gauge glasses, and light fittings probably caused by the depth charges and also by ignorantly conceived attempts to destroy various fittings. The latter damage was chiefly to attack instruments, the master compass, prisoners claim that this was damaged by the depth charges, and possibly some wireless gear, but it was by no means thoroughly done. The main motors, main engines and pumps, compressors, auxiliaries, etc. appeared to be undamaged. The main battery tanks, two in number, were apparently dry and sound. It is doubted whether chlorine was ever present. The batteries were fully discharged and provided only lighting and did not give sufficient power to run the HP air compressor. The HP air services were apparently undamaged except for possible strain joints, but in all, the air groups were practically empty. Section 6. Details of U-570 General Remarks U-570 is a 500-ton U-boat of the series U-563 to U-570, designed by Friedrich Krupp, Germania Yard, Kiel, and built by Blom & Voss Yard, Hamburg. She is a Type 7C. The general particulars as follows, as taken from one of the notebooks taken from the crew. Length overall. 67.1 meters or 220.2 feet. Length at waterline 65.9 meters or 216.21 feet. Maximum beam 6.18 meters or 20.275 feet. Height from lower edge of keel to upper deck 5.95 meters or 19.52 feet. Height from lower edge of keel to upper edge of conning tower structure, 9.4 meters, 19.52 feet. Draft at normal load, 4.53 meters, or 14.86 feet. Draft at maximum load, 4.76 meters, 15.61 feet. Displacement at normal load, 710 Point eight zero cubic meters or 688 tons displacement at maximum load 760.70 cubic meters 736 tons maximum diameter of pressure hull 4.70 meters or 15.42 feet length of pressure hull 49.40 meters or 162.07 feet. Height of keel below base 0 0.55 meters or 1.8 feet. Height of periscope extended above keel 14.612 meters 47.935 feet. Periscope withdrawn to upper edge of conning tower structure. 9,397 meters, or 30.81 feet. Breadth of keel, 1.64 meters, or 5.38 feet. 
beam including compensating tank 6.1 meters 20.01 feet beam at waterline 4.53 meters 14.86 feet general construction of the boat translated from a notebook belonging to a mechanician second class the shape of the conning tower is formed in the horizontal section aft of an ellipse and on either side and forward arcs kreisbogen which merge together without any flat surfaces the radii forward are 575 millimeters and for the side walls 2260 millimeters in order to reduce the speed resistance of the boat when submerged, the conning tower is surrounded by a casing, Tunverkleidung. The upper part of the conning tower is sectioned off by a conning tower covering, Tarundeke, consisting of a steel casting, 30 millimeter thick. This is welded to the conning tower casing by plates, 32 millimeters, 1.2 inches thick. In the conning tower are situated periscope aft with oil pressure motor, steering pedestal for main rudder, and torpedo firing apparatus. Telegraph orders, powers, and speeds. U-boats, type 7C. Following lists by diesels and electric motors and diesel electric being one diesel propelling, one diesel charging. Listing column with telegraph orders of dead slow, slow, half speed, etc. In revolutions, speed in knots for diesel and electric motors, etc. Underwater sound apparatus. The UT Anlage Underwater Telegraphic Apparatus Sonic consists of two transmitters and two receivers on each side of the submarine mounted with axis nearly vertical. A total of four transmitters and four receivers. The transmitters are believed to be of the sonic wall type, excited directly from an alternator and controlled by a magnetic relay and a Morse key. The receivers are probably of the moving coil type connected direct to an amplifier fitted with telephones. The frequency of transmission is believed to be 3000 cycles but may be higher as a supply alternator has the unusual speed of 5150 RPMs and is fitted with a governor. The GH gear, multi-unit hydrophone gear, consists of 48 Rochelle salt receivers arranged in a circle on the ship's bottom well forward near the foreplanes. Each receiver is fitted with a one-valve head amplifier and is connected to an electrical compensator with a built-in filter amplifier which enables the direction of a continuous sound to be obtained probably with considerable accuracy. Reception is by telephone and the amplifier is fitted with high-pass filters to cut out frequencies below 500, 1000, 3000, 6000, and 10,000 cycles. The highest filter previously met with has been 6,000 cycles in Spindrift, formerly Polaris. The use of crystal receivers in multi-unit sets is not new, as some of the later Dutch submarines were fitted with these, but 48 is an unusually large number to be fitted. The shallow or supersonic set consists of a single MS transmitter and receiver probably with a frequency of about 15,000 cycles. Transmission is by condenser discharge, and depth is indicated by a neon tube indicator with a scale 0 to 125 meters. The deep or sonic echo sounding set consists of three wall type sonic transmitters operated in parallel and three moving coil receivers operated in series. The frequency used is 3000 cycles, the transmitter being supplied by an alternator generating 1500 cycles. Depths are indicated on the same neon tube indicator as the shallow sounding gear, but with scales up to 1,000 and 3,000 meters. Hand transmissions and oral reception, presumably with stopwatch, can also be used. Note: 
This may account for the signals heard by our submarines when keeping anti-submarine watch off Lorient. At the time, it was suggested that they might be using echo-sounding transmissions from an enemy submarine making the 100-fathom line. These would be audible on the hydrophones and probably on the ASDIC. All the above apparatus is made by Electroacoustic Company of Kiel. Detector or S-gear, Suchgerät, usually known as S-gerät. The S-gear is the German ASDIC and is manufactured by Electroacoustic of Kiel, commercially as the Ultrometer, and by the Atleswerke of Bremen, commercially as the Paraphone. It consists of a combined magnetostriction transmitter or receiver which can be used for telegraphy and telephony, echo ranging and hydrophone effect listening. The frequency used is probably between 15,000 and 20,000 cycles. The apparatus, which is retractable, projects through the ballast keel near the fore end of the control room. It is a short-range supersonic echo-ranging apparatus of the magnetostriction type and is fitted primarily for mine detection purposes. It is only emerging from the experimental stage and U-570 was one of the first, if not the first U-boat to be fitted with it. In its present form, it is not very serviceable. U-570's apparatus had broken down and was not in working order at the time of her capture. The maximum detection range is 500 meters and the practical range is about 300 meters. The combined transmitter receiver comprises four packs of nickel stampings and was said to be energized with 4,000 volts transformed up from a 110 volt supply. The beam angle is stated to be plus minus 45 degrees and no means of training the beam is provided. Prisoners believed that the amplifying and recording unit of the S gear is known as the AEG apparatus since it was made by the AEG company. The transmitted and received pulses are applied to a cathode ray tube in front of which is an optical projection system which casts an image of the CR tube trace on the ground glass screen provided with a range scale graduated in meters. An earlier statement that the S apparatus was used for blind underwater firing of torpedoes has been contradicted and is not now believed. Section 7 Diesel Electric Propulsion A chief mechanician prisoner claiming expert knowledge of diesels gave the following explanation of the term diesel electric. Diesel electric propulsion is used when it is desired to put one diesel out of action for repairs or other reasons and it is nevertheless required to turn both screws. The electric motors are dual purpose motors. They can be used either as dynamos or as generators as required. The switching over from one use to the other is done by means of a switchboard and a series of resistances. The whole procedure takes but a few seconds. If it is required, for example, to stop port diesel and keep underway on the other diesel, the starboard generator is started from the batteries. The compression cocks of the starboard diesel are opened, the generator slowed down and the clutch slowly let in, thus turning the diesel engine. The cocks are then shut and the diesel will run under its own power. The dynamo is then switched off and the speed of the diesel increased so that the starboard generator produces enough electricity to drive the port dynamo. The electricity produced is led through the batteries to prevent the current fluctuating. The following table found among captured documents would therefore indicate that if one diesel is turning at 285 revs at slow speed and the electric motor is coupled with it, the number of revs is reduced to 240. The electricity produced is sufficient to turn the other screw at 155 revs. The loss in revolutions is due to the loss of power in the process of conversion. The differences in speed between port and starboard propellers is counteracted by the rudder. Table provided lists telegraph orders by slow, half speed, three fifth speed, and four fifth speed, along with the diesel's revolutions in speed in knots, electric motor's revolutions by speed in knots, and the diesel-electric hybrid speed in knots and revolutions. Section 8. Degaussing. A prisoner stated that U-boats are degaussed by alternating current treatment 
and have to be retreated after every cruise. Section 9. Other U-Boats U-15. The loss in February 1940 of U-15, a 250-ton U-boat of the older type, was mentioned in Confidential Book 04051, 9, 10, and 13. The chief quartermaster of U-570 added some further information on this point. He stated that a German cruiser had rammed and cut U-15 in half. U-17 A torpedo rating who had served in U-17, a 250-ton U-boat of the older type, from about the middle of December 1939 until November 1940, stated that Captain Lieutenant Udo Behrens was in command during the earlier part of that period, and that only two war cruises were made. The first was said to have been carried out towards the end of January 1940 and lasted 14 days. The U-boat proceeding from Kiel through the Kiel Canal and to the North Sea as far as the eastern end of the English Channel, it was claimed that two ships were sunk, the first with one electric torpedo and the second with one or two electric torpedoes. U-17 then returned to Wilhelmshaven and then through the Kiel Canal to Kiel. Other officers stated to have been on board were Leutnantzer C. Gerhard Massmann, now in command of U-137, and, as engineer officer, Oberleutnant Engineer Rolf Wieder. The second cruise of U-17 was said to have started on 4th or 5th April 1940 from Wilhelmshaven and to have lasted until 1st May 1940. It is known that U-17 took part in the Norwegian operations. Prisoner stated that nothing was sunk on this cruise. On her return to Kiel, U-17 was said to have remained alongside the wharf until shortly after Whitson, and then to have proceeded along to the anti-submarine school at Gottenhafen. Prisoner added that when he was transferred on November 1940, she was still at that port, under the command of Oberleutnant Zersi Kohlmann, now in command of U-562. U-19 Confirmation was obtained of the fact that U-19 was commanded at the outbreak of war by Captain Lieutenant Meckel, who was subsequently transferred to the staff of Vice Admiral U-Boats, being succeeded by Captain Lieutenant Joachim Schepke, CB04051-13 and CB4051-19. The chief quartermaster of U-570 claimed to have served in U-19 under Gott, Meckel and Schepke. U-19 appears to have carried out at least one cruise under Meckel, which was a mine-laying cruise, and prisoner claimed that Meckel had been congratulated by the Vice Admiral U-Boats personally on having successfully laid mines as required. These mines were said to have been magnetic. A further incident alleged to have occurred in the early war history of U-19 was the escape from a torpedo attack off the Shetlands after sighting a periscope and diving to 40 meters, or 131 feet. The torpedo was heard to pass overhead. On another occasion, U-19 was described as having entered the mouth of the Humber. A light scene at first thought to be a lighthouse or beacon of some kind proved to be a destroyer about 165 yards away. U-19 was said to have crash-dived, laid magnetic mines, and returned safely to her base. Prisoner believed that the lookout Captain British Destroyer must have been poor, as U-19 was apparently neither seen nor heard. This man also mentioned the occasion in which Shepka in U-19 had attacked a convoy of ships off an east coast port, sunk three of them. See Charlie Baker 405119. This incident appears to have occurred in early 1940. New alleged facts given by prisoners were that Shepke had got through the British mine barrage by waiting for and then following a merchant ship. A further detail was given that the convoy attacked afterwards consisted of seven ships. It was mentioned in Charlie Baker 405119 that three of the ships were claimed by Shepke to have been sunk. Prisoner stated that U-19 carried out six war cruises and was then transferred to the training flotilla, proceeding first to Varnemunde, 
where her command was taken over by Captain Lieutenant Eberhard Hoffmann, and thence to Gothenhaven. Prisoner denied that U-19 had been lost, as stated by prisoners captured in July 1940, Charlie Baker 405114, and insisted that she is still in service as a training U-boat. U-37, a prisoner who claimed to have served formerly in U-37 under the command of Corvette Captain Werner Hartmann, contributed some statements about the early war cruises of this U-boat. He said that Hartmann had carried out four war cruises, on the first of which nothing was sunk, but on the second cruise the sinking of 35,000 tons was claimed, 45,000 tons for the third cruise, and 27,000 tons for the fourth cruise, on which U-37 took part in the Norwegian operations. The latter total was stated to include a cruiser of the London or Glasgow class, but Prisoner added that he did not know whether or not this cruiser actually sank. The following names of other officers in U-37 during these cruises were given. First Lieutenant, Oberleutnant Bauer during first and second cruises, Oberleutnant Karl Clausen during third and fourth cruises, Junior Officer, Lieutenant Zersi Pohl during all four cruises, Engineer Officer, Oberleutnant Engineer Gerd Zuren during all four cruises. U-48 Several prisoners stated that U-48, Captain Lieutenant Herbert Schulze, was out on a war cruise at the end of August or early in September 1941. He is known to have relieved Corvette Captain Rusing in command of the 3rd U-boat flotilla on 26th July 1941. U-59 A petty officer telegraphist claiming to have made a number of war cruises in U-59, first under Captain Lieutenant Harald Jurst, said this officer was succeeded about the middle of 1940 by Captain Lieutenant Joachim Matz, under whom prisoners served for several further cruises in U-59. As Matz is known to have been appointed U-70 in late autumn in 1940, these later cruises must have been made between July and November 1940. Matz was said to have been relieved about November 1940 by another Captain Lieutenant, or Lieutenant Commander. Prisoners' statements do not agree with Matz's own account of his activities during that time, as that officer claimed that he had not been to sea during the period in question. In view of the shortage of U-boat captains, and as Matz agrees that he recovered from his illness by July 1940, it seems likely that he was in command of U-59 for some months before being transferred to U-70 late in the year. Prisoner denied that U-59 had ever laid any mines during his service aboard and had operated in the North Sea, although he believed that she was now based on Lorient. U-69 this U-boat, believed to have been under the command of Captain Lieutenant Joost Metzler, sank five merchant ships totaling 31,500 tons off the west coast of Africa, according to a German radio announcement of 27 June 1941. From captured documents, it was established that U-69 was in touch with a convoy proceeding in the same direction as herself, and it sunk two ships of this convoy. She was, however, short of fuel and had orders to report to touch with the convoy to U-123 operating nearby. But U-69 failed to maintain touch with the convoy, did not report that this failure was due to a lack of fuel, and did not even report to the Vice Admiral U-Boats the latest position and course of the convoy. The German communique quoted above indicated that the position was off the west coast of Africa. On 1st August 1941, the award of the Knight Insignia of the Iron Cross to Metzler was announced. It was added that his U-boat had sunk 11 armed merchant ships, totaling 76,170 tons, one of which was sunk by gunfire at night, as no torpedoes were left. A German broadcast gave the tonnage of this ship as 5,000 tons, and praised Metzler's courage in attacking by gunfire so formidable a foe as an armed merchant ship. 
On 2nd August 1941, the German radio broadcast an interview with Metzler in which he stated that he had returned the day before to a point on the west coast of France after a long cruise to the West African coast. He described the heat and dampness of the climate in South Atlantic waters and added that some of the U-boat's supplies had gone bad, but were replaced by fish caught by the crew. It thus appears that the claim made on 27th June 1941 refers to the earlier part of this extended cruise and is again included in the total announced on 1st August 1941. Metzler has now been relieved in command of U-69 by Corvette Captain Zahn. U-79 On 27th June 1941, U-79 incurred censure from the Vice Admiral U-boats for having broken off touch with a convoy not yet reported in adequate detail and for having started home without any apparently urgent reason, as she still had 24 cubic meters of fuel left. U-82 It was established that U-82 was built at the Volkenjahr Wegsack Bremen. She is the same type as U-570, namely 7C of 500 tons. Her dockyard number appears to have been Weg 10. She was commissioned on 14th May 1941 and allocated to the 3rd U-boat flotilla. U-84 and U-87 Prisoners from U-501 stated that U-84 and U-87 left Horten for Trondheim at the same time as U-501 soon after 20th July 1941. U-85 this U-boat, one of the series U-83 to U-87, built by the Flenderwerke Lübeck, where she was known to the dockyard workers as Flender 281. She was commissioned on 7th June 1941 and was allocated to the 3rd U-boat flotilla. U-101 A prisoner claimed to have made five cruises in U-101, under Captain Lieutenant Fritz Frauerheim. It is known from statements of earlier prisoners that U-101 was under construction early in 1940 and that she left on her first cruise on a date before June 1940. It seems likely that this prisoner's first cruise was also U-101's first cruise. This was said to have been carried out in April 1940 after the start of the Norwegian operations, probably during the second half of the month and lasted 10 to 12 days, the U-boat was said to have gone from Kiel to Trondheim and back, and to have sunk nothing. After two weeks rests in Kiel, U-101 was stated to have proceeded to the Atlantic on a war cruise of five or six weeks duration, and to have sunk a number of ships sailing independently and totaling 40,000 tons, after which she returned to Kiel about the middle of June 1940. This alleged achievement is believed to be that referred to in the German High Command communique of 17th June 1940, which alleged that Frauenheim had sunk 41,500 tons of shipping, including the 11,400-ton Wellington Star. As mentioned in Confidential Book 405120, page 20, U-101 left Kiel on or about 10th August 1940. According to Prisoner, this was her third war cruise from which she proceeded to Lorient. On 3rd September 1940, Frauenheim was awarded the Knight Insignia of the Iron Cross and the German High Command claimed that on his last cruise he had sunk 11 ships, most of them in convoy amounting to 58,000 tons. It was stated by the above-mentioned prisoner that U-101 remained at Lorient for about three weeks before setting out on her fourth cruise, during which she was said to have sunk about 50,000 tons of shipping before returning to Lorient. As mentioned in Confidential Book 405120, page 20, the German authorities credited Frauenheim on the 19th October 1940 with having sunk 51,000 tons during the preceding days. After three weeks at Lorient, U-101 
set out on her fifth cruise, according to prisoner, early in November, and returned to Lorient after twelve days, having sunk fifty-six thousand tons of shipping. According to the above evidence, Frauenheim's total sinkings to the end of November 1940 thus amounted to approximately 200,000 tons of shipping. There has been no further mention of Frauenheim in German official communiques, but prisoner captured in June 1941 at the sinking of U-556 stated that this officer's total was then still 195,000 tons. It would thus appear that Frauenheim did not go to sea again in U-101, or at least did not achieve further success. It is also known that Frauenheim was appointed late in 1940 or early in 1941 to instruct at the U-boat school at Pilau. It is also known that early in March 1941, Captain Lieutenant Mengersen was already in command of U-101 and may have been appointed to the U-boat at a much earlier date. The sinking of five ships totaling 41,000 tons in 2nd December 1940, attributed to Mengersen by the German High Command communique of 3rd J December 1940, may have been achieved in U-101, as stated in Charlie Baker 4051-23, page 27. But this could not be confirmed, as prisoner mentioned above left the U-boat soon after her return from her fifth cruise. This man, however, gave an interesting account of sabotage alleged to have occurred in U-101 about April or May 1941, according to which a diesel exhaust pipe was seriously weakened by dockyard workers, admitted to have been Germans. During a refit later, during a cruise, while U-101 was making a special effort to get away on the surface after an attack on shipping, this exhaust pipe broke, filling the U-boat with dense black fumes. Prisoner added that three men died as a result of inhaling these fumes, while four men were incapacitated for life, and may also have died later. This incident was said to have occurred on the twelfth day of a cruise, just after U-101 had fired her last torpedo. She was said to have returned to her base safely. Many arrests were alleged to have been made in Lorient as a result of this sabotage. U-123 As mentioned above, U-123 Captain Lieutenant Oscar Müller is known to have been operating on 27th June 1941 in the immediate vicinity of U-69, apparently off the west coast of Africa. He has since been relieved in command of this U-boat by Captain Lieutenant Hardigan. U-124 The German radio broadcast on 7th October 1941 an interview with Captain Lieutenant Johann Mohr on his return from his first cruise as captain of a U-boat. This officer is known to command U-124, having formerly served in her as first lieutenant and having succeeded Captain Lieutenant Schultz. It was claimed that Moore had followed all day and attacked at night a convoy of eight merchant ships, protected by a destroyer and a corvette, proceeding from Great Britain to Gibraltar, and had sunk two large tankers. After reloading his tubes, Moore was about to attack the convoy later when Schnee got in before him and sank the three remaining ships in sight. NID note. Schnee's part in this attack is given under U-201. Moore alleged that the escorting corvette made off quickly instead of picking up survivors from the sunk vessels. He professed to have followed this ship for a while until she disappeared into the darkness. The next episode of this cruise was stated to have been an attack at night on a British cruiser escorting a much bigger and better protected convoy Coming from the south, the German torpedo was said to have missed as the cruiser was zigzagging very sharply. Moore claimed to have then sunk, by means of two torpedoes, a huge tanker of 12,000 tons, and to have attacked but missed a destroyer. U-126 The German radio announced that the U-boat commanded by Captain Lieutenant Ernst Bauer had assisted with 
great success in the sinking recently of 116,000 tons of shipping in the Battle of the Atlantic. U-132 This U-boat, built by the Volkenyard Vegesack Bremen, where she was known to the dockyard workers as Veg-11, she was commissioned on 29th May 1941 and allocated to the 3rd U-boat flotilla. U-141 This U-boat appears to have been transferred from the 21st U-boat flotilla to the 3rd U-boat flotilla on 1st May 1941. She was probably completed and commissioned in 1940, probably as early as July, since U-138 was commissioned on 27th June 1940. She is known to have been at her base as late as 14th July 1941. Oberleutnant Zersief Philipp Schuler is believed to be in command of U-141. According to a German radio broadcast of 30th July 1941, Schuler's U-boat took an important part in the alleged sinking of 116,000 tons of shipping during the preceding days in the Battle of the Atlantic. In a broadcast interview on 25th August 1941, an announcer recounted Schuller's recent experience, presumably referring to the sinkings mentioned above. He stated that Schuller had met the convoy concern at midnight, but that the northern lights provided visibility. He described the convoy as having been protected by five modern destroyers and many other vessels. He claimed that Schuller torpedoed Firstly, a 6,000-ton steamer, which sank after her boilers had exploded. Then a 10,000-ton ship, which was still sinking when he sank his third victim, a 5,000-ton ship, which also exploded. After this, the U-boat was stated to have been obliged to dive and to have been attacked with many depth charges. It was added that Schuller had formerly served under Captain Lieutenant Joachim Schepke, this officer lost his life when U-100 was rammed and sunk by HMS Vanock on 17th March 1941. Confidential Book 4051-19 U-143 From the fact that only 21 men are known to have been drafted to this U-boat, she is presumed to be a 300-ton type. She was transferred from 22nd U-Boat Flotilla to the 3rd U-Boat Flotilla on 1st May 1941. U-147 This U-Boat seems to have been transferred from 22nd U-Boat Flotilla to 3rd U-Boat Flotilla on 1st May 1941. U-201 The German radio announced on 8th September 1941 that the knight insignia of the Iron Cross had been awarded to Oberleutnant Zersee Aldebert Schnee, it is known that this officer is in command of U-201. It was announced that he had previously commanded a small U-boat on three war cruises during which he had sunk 70,000 tons of merchant shipping and was then appointed captain of another U-boat in which, at the date of the announcement, he had increased his total sinkings to 12 ships, totaling 95,000 tons. On 7th October 1941, the German radio claimed that Schnee's U-boat had sunk the three remaining ships of a convoy of eight merchant ships proceeding from England to Gibraltar after the U-boat commanded by Captain Lieutenant Johann Moore had sunk two of the other ships, both of them tankers. U-203 According to a German broadcast, the U-boat commanded by Captain Lieutenant Rolf Mützelberg, believed to be U-203, had a successful first war cruise during which she encountered three other U-boats. It was claimed that she sank two ships on her first attack and was then attacked herself by depth charges but was able to surface and to continue the chase. On the second attack on the same southward-bound convoy, this U-boat was said to have sunk three merchant ships, a destroyer, and to have then returned to her base owing to lack of fuel. According to other supplementary information, U-203 was, on 24th June 1941, the only U-boat in touch with an outward-bound convoy. Close by, 
and at some distance away there were several U-boats which might have cooperated successfully in this area. U-203 suffered a broken external exhaust gas valve and started for home without reporting the latest position of the convoy. This neglect occasioned a reproof from the Vice Admiral U-boats. On 30th July 1941, the German radio claimed that Mützelberg had sunk a large share of the 116,000 tons recently disposed of in the Battle of the Atlantic. Some days later, on 4th August 1941, the German radio claimed the sinking of a larger total, namely 140,000 tons, also one corvette and one destroyer, of these sinkings, 31,000 tons of merchant shipping and the destroyer were attributed to Mützelberg. It was added that the cruise in question was only that officer's second cruise. U-204 Captain Lieutenant Kell is believed to be in command of U-204. The German press of 3rd September 1941 and various German broadcasts during the following days made a series of announcements from which it appears that Kell's U-boat claims to have sunk two freighters and a destroyer of the Afridi class during an attack off the coast of Portugal on a convoy from Gibraltar. It was claimed that the Germans had sunk 122,000 tons of shipping in this convoy. Kell added that two other U-boats had participated in the attack, one torpedoing six ships totaling 36,000 tons and the other eight ships four of which Kell claimed to have seen sink. Kell was described as having a fascist or typical U-boat beard. U-205 It appears that U-205 was built by the Germania Werft Kiel, was commissioned on 3rd May 1941, and was allocated to the 3rd U-boat flotilla, as 40 men, exclusive of officer, were drafted to this U-boat, she is presumed to be a 500-ton type. She is under the command of Captain Lieutenant Reschke. U-206 This U-boat, of the same series as U-205, also built by Germania Werft Kiel, also seems to have been commissioned on 17th May 1941, and was allocated to the 3rd U-boat flotilla. She is commanded by Oberleutnant Zersi Herbri Opitz. U-332 This U-boat, built by the Nordseewerke Emden, had a complement of 41 chief and petty officers and men drafted to her, and therefore appears to be a 500-ton type U-boat. She is believed to have been commissioned on 7th June 1941. U-373 This U-boat, built by the Kriegsmarine Werft Kiel, appears to have been commissioned on 22nd May 1941 and was allocated to the 3rd U-boat flotilla. As 39 men, exclusive of officer, were drafted to her, she appears to be a 500-ton U-boat. U-402 Built by the Danziger Werft Danzig, U-402 is believed to have been commissioned about the middle of May 1941 and was allocated to the 3rd U-boat flotilla. As 17 technical ratings, the usual number allocated to a 500-ton U-boat were drafted to U-402 on 17th May 1941, and 16 navigational personnel together with 4 telegraphists were drafted to this U-boat on 21st May 1941, making a total crew of 37 exclusive of officers, it is presumed that she is of this type. U-431 This U-boat was built by the Schischalwerft Danzig and appears to have been commissioned on 5th April 1941 and was allocated to the 3rd U-boat flotilla. As 41 men exclusive of officers were drafted to this U-boat, she is presumed to be a 500-ton type. Captain Lieutenant Frielenhaus was appointed to U-431 for the last three weeks of May 1941. U-431 is known to have been in a German port on the 28th May 1941. This U-boat is now believed to be commanded by Captain Lieutenant Domus. U-432 
432. It is believed that this U-boat, built by the Schischalwerft Danzig, was commissioned on 26 April 1941 and was allocated to the 3rd U-boat flotilla. As at least 38 chief and petty officers and men were appointed to this U-boat, it appears that she is a 500-ton type. Prisoners from U-501 stated that their U-boat received a signal from U-432 about four hours before the former sighted convoy SC-42 on night 10th to 11th September 1941. This signal announced that U-432 was already in touch with the convoy. U-433 This 500-ton U-boat built by the Schischalwerkt Danzig, appears to have been commissioned on 24th May 1941 and was allocated to the 3rd U-boat flotilla. She is of the same series as U-431 and U-432. She is commanded by Oberleutnant Zersi A. U-451 from the fact that 39 chief and petty officers and men were drafted to U-451, it appears that she is a 500-ton type U-boat. She was built by the Deutsche Werk Kiel, commissioned on 3rd May 1941, and was allocated to the 3rd U-boat flotilla. U-452 This 500-ton U-boat of the same series as U-451, and built by the Deutsche Werk Kiel, was Commissioned on 29th May 1941, probably about three and a half weeks after U-451, and was also allocated to the 3rd U-boat flotilla. She is commanded by Captain Leutnant March. U-502 Prisoners from U-501 stated that U-502, a U-boat of the same series built at the Deutsche Werke Finkenwerder Hamburg, had been launched by the end of April 1941 and had left the dockyard early in June 1941 to carry out her trials. The captain of U-502 was described as a Kapitän Leutnant with a pointed beard. It was implied, but could not be confirmed, that this officer was Corvette Captain Hans Gerrit von Stockhausen, who formerly commanded U-65. The captain of U-502 was said to have presented Forster, the captain of U-501, with a toy hippopotamus as a mascot, and to have received in return a toy goat. These animals were said to have been adopted by the respective U-boats as their badges, and were painted on their conning towers. U-503 This U-boat of the same series as U-501 was stated to have been launched before the end of April 1941. U-504 and U-505 The petty officer telegraphist of U-501 was of the opinion that U-504 and U-505 of the same series as U-501 were to be equipped with detector gear. S. Gerrit. This gear was not installed in U-501, commissioned at an earlier date than U-504 and U-505. U-552. Frankfurt broadcast on 8th October 1941, records stated to have been made on board a U-boat in the North Atlantic between Greenland and Iceland. The record was made by a commentator named Heinrich Schwitsch, and said that the U-boat had been cruising unsuccessfully for 14 days, but had that afternoon sighted on the port side a convoy protected by two zigzagging destroyers. The record reproduced the orders, conversations, and sounds in the U-boat stated to have been penetrated past the escorts and the other column of ships right into the center of the convoy as a number of torpedoes were fired. The first torpedo was alleged to have been fired from a good distance at a 5,000-ton tanker, which was hit in the engine room and immediately sank by the stern, but without the oil catching fire. Two vessels were described as colliding, and one of them as later breaking in two, and these ships were said to be firing red tracer bullets. These ships were said to be heavily laden freighters of 7,000 and 5,000 tons, 
the former to have sunk and the latter to have probably sunk. The next record stated that the U-boat escaped from pursuing destroyers after hearing the detonations of torpedoes of other U-boats attacking the convoy. The stalking and sinking by means of two torpedoes of a tanker estimated at 10,000 tons is then described in lurid detail, the commander gloating over the columns of flame and burning oil on the sea. He added that the tanker fired on the U-boat but missed. The night's total sinkings were given as 22,000 tons. Another German radio broadcast of 10th October 1941 by the Deutschland Sender purporting to be records made in the same U-boat in the Atlantic on her way back to her base and moving parallel to the west coast of Great Britain, announced that the U-boat was commanded by Oberleutnant Zersi Erich Topp. This officer is known to be in command of U-552. U-567 This 500-ton U-boat, built by Blom and Voss Yards Hamburg, was apparently commissioned on 24th April 1941 and was allocated to the 3rd U-Boat Flotilla. U-568 Of the same series as U-562, this U-Boat was commissioned on 1st May 1941 and was allocated to the 3rd U-Boat Flotilla. Prisoners from U-570 claim to have seen her subsequently in Kiel and later in Horten, and at Trondheim in August 1941. They stated that she left on her first war cruise shortly before or about the same time as U-570 set out 24th August 1941. U-569 also belonging to the same series which included U-67 to U-573 and other U-boats of lower and higher identity numbers, U-567 was commissioned on 8th May 1941. She is commanded by Oberleutnant Zersi Heinsch. U-571 This U-boat of the series U-563 to U-574 was commissioned on 22nd May 1941. Prisoners claim to have seen her at Horton on a date between 13th and 23rd July 1941 and in Trondheim in August 1941. U-572 U-572 of the series of U-563 to U-574 built by Blom and Voss Hamburg, was commissioned on 29th May 1941. U-573 This U-boat was commissioned on 5th June 1941. U-652 This U-boat was built at the Horvardswerk at Hamburg and appears to be a 500-ton type as 17 technical petty officers and ratings were drafted on 20th March 1941 to U-652. Orders of 2nd April included the names of these men in a crew list of three officers, 15 chief and petty officers, and 23 ratings, making a total of 41. The officers were Oberleutnant Zersi, Georg Werner Fratz, and Remus, and Leutnant Engineer Lichtenberg. U-652 was allocated to the 3rd U-Boat Flotilla. U-701 This U-Boat was built by the Sturkenwerft Hamburg. She was commissioned on 16th July 1941 with a complement of 39 men exclusive of officers. She is believed to be a 500-ton U-Boat Type 7C. U-752 This U-boat, built at Wilhelmshaven, was commissioned on 24th May 1941 with a complement of 40 men, exclusive of officers, and is presumed to be of the 500-ton type. U-753 Of the same series as U-752, this U-boat was commissioned on 28th June 1941 and allocated to the 3rd U-Boat Flotilla. U-A 
a prisoner claimed to have witnessed the return of U.A. from a cruise. He stated that she had been badly damaged and that the crew was in a very weak state. Another prisoner said that U.A. had a revolving gun platform forward of the conning tower. U.B. The first lieutenant of U-570 stated that he saw U.B., then HMS Seal, towed into Frederikshaven, Denmark, by a trawler after being captured. Prisoner believed that the British captain was no longer on board the submarine at the time. A rating claimed to have served later in U.B. said that she would not work properly on the oil fuel used by the Germans. Various changes were said to have been made in the submarine. This man said that she had visited the island of Bornholm on one occasion. On 21st May 1941, technical personnel consisting of five chief petty officers, six petty officers, and 14 ratings were drafted to UB, which was allocated to the third U-boat flotilla. Most of the above personnel were experienced men. On 15th July 1941, UB, together with UD-1, UD-3, and UD-4, were placed under the U-boat base at Kiel as regards to personnel and administrative organization. Several prisoners said, however, that UB had proved useless and had now been dismantled, but this statement could not be confirmed. UD-1 On 1st May 1941, Nine technical petty officers and men were drafted to UD-1, believed to have been built in Rotterdam. On 15th July 1941, she was placed under the administration of the Kiel U-boat base. This series of U-boats, UD-1 to UD-5, are believed to be the Dutch submarines under construction at Rotterdam when the Germans invaded the country. UD-3 this U-boat is known to have been built at Rotterdam and to have been commissioned on 8th June 1941 with a complement of 38 men excluding officers. On 15th July 1941, UD-3 was placed under the administration of the Kiel U-boat base. UD-4 By the 20th June 1941, eight members of the crew of UD-4 had been drafted to the U-boat. On 1st July 1941, the four telegraphists were transferred to the U-boat tender Erwin Wasner. On 11th July, the torpedo petty officer of UD-4 was transferred to UD-5, apparently still under construction at Rotterdam, and replaced by the torpedo petty officer from UD-5. On 15th July 1941, UD-4 was one of the four U-boats placed under the administration of the Kiel U-boat base. Unidentified U-boats A petty officer telegraphist stated that he had intercepted a signal from a U-boat which had picked up at sea two British officers and four British men, the crew of an aeroplane. The date of this alleged rescue was given as about 4th August 1941 or a little later. The batteries of a training U-boat at Gottenhafen were stated to have become exhausted on one occasion, and the U-boat sank to 80 meters. Chlorine gas formed inside the pressure hull, and the U-boat was only brought to the surface after 10 hours of tremendous effort. Section 10 U-boat construction. From an examination of the dates on which U-boats are known to have been commissioned, the following facts have been established and may indicate the rate of production in some of the U-boat building yards. Blom and Voss, Hamburg. U-556 was commissioned on Thursday, 6th February 1941. U-567 was commissioned on Thursday, 24th April 1941, and U-568 to U-573 on successive Thursdays up to 5th June 1941. The series is known to include the U-551 to U-574, and if the rate of production has been maintained, as is most likely to have been the case, this yard produced 24 500-ton U-boats 
between 2nd January 1941 and 12th June 1941, at the rate of one U-boat every Thursday. Holwald Yard, Hamburg. This yard is known to be producing a series of 500-ton U-boats starting with U-651, commissioned on 12th February 1941. There are reasons for believing that U-652 was commissioned on 20th March 1941, approximately five weeks later, and U-654 about 10th May 1941. Volkenyard, Vegasak, Bremen U-82, built by this yard and known by her dockyard number as Veg-10, was commissioned on 14th May 1941. The U-boat, known by the dockyard number as Veg-11, was U-132, commissioned two weeks later on 29th May 1941 and appears to have been one of a new series of 500-ton U-boats, U-132 to U-136 being built by the Wolkan Yard. Wilhelmshaven Yard this yard is known to be building a series of 500-ton U-boats, starting with U-751. U-751 was commissioned on 24th May 1941, and U-753 on 18th June 1941, less than four weeks later. Germania Yard, Kiel U-205 was commissioned on Saturday, 3rd May 1941, and U-207 on Saturday, 17th May, 1941, exactly two weeks later. This yard is of the most important U-boat building yards and is likely to have been adopted for regular mass production of 500-ton U-boats. Deutsche Werke, Kiel. This yard includes the Kriegsmarinewerft, Kiel, U-451, 500 tons built at this yard was commissioned on 3rd May 1941, and U-452 was commissioned on 29th May 1941, just under four weeks later. As U-141, U-143, and U-147, all 300 tonners, all appear to have been commissioned early in May 1941, it is possible that they belong to a series of U-boats of which several were laid down about the same time. Hitherto, only the Deutsche Werke and the Germania Yard, both of Kiel, have been known to construct the 250 or 300 ton types. The last of this small type, definitely known to have been built by the Germania Yard, was U-24, laid down on 1st April 1936. It appears that this yard no longer builds small U-boats. It thus seems likely that the series including U-141, U-143, and U-147 is being built by the Deutsche Werke Kiel, especially as the preceding series, U-137 to U-141, all 300 tonners, is known to have been built by this yard. The complete series appears to be U-137 to U-150. Schischalwurft Danzig The 500-ton U-431 built by this yard, was commissioned on Saturday, 5th April 1941, and U-432, exactly three weeks later, on Saturday, 26th April 1941, and the U-433, four weeks later, after the latter date, namely on Saturday, 24th May 1941. It is presumed that this yard is building other U-boats of this series. U-Boat Series in Confidential Book 405129, Section 8. Further information makes it possible to amplify this list, as U-85 is known to have been built by the Flinderwerke Lübeck, it appears that the series U-83 to U-87, 500-ton U-Boats type 7B, is being built by this yard, and also a Later series of 500-ton boats, type 7C, U88 to U92. It is believed that a series of U-boats under construction at the Volkenjahr Vegesack Bremen starts with U132, and not with U131. The latter U-boat 
may be the last of a series hitherto thought to include U-122 to U-130, 740 tonners, built by the Deschimag Yard, Bremen. The series of U-boats built by Nordseewerke Emden, starting with U-331, is now known to consist of 500 tonners. The series of U-boats beginning with U-401, built by the Schischalwerft Danzig, is known to consist of 500 tonners. The series of 500 ton U-boats, starting with U-451, is now known to have been built by the Deutsche Werke Kiel, which includes the Kriegsmarinewerft Kiel. The series of 500 ton type 7C U-boats, starting with U-701, is now known to be under construction by the Stulkenwerft Hamburg, and not by the Deschimag Yard Bremen. This is the first indication from prisoner of war sources that the former yard is building U-boats. The UD-1 series built at Rotterdam includes at least three further U-boats, UD-3, UD-4, and UD-5, presumably also UD-2, of which no information is as yet available. These are Dutch submarines which were under construction at Rotterdam at the time of the German invasion. Section 11. Third U-Boat Flotilla The third U-Boat Flotilla was formed on 1st March 1941 with Corvette Capitaine, or Commander, Rusing as flotilla chief. This officer was relieved by Corvette Capitaine Herbert Schulze who assumed command of the flotilla on 26 July 1941. The flotilla is based on La Palisse and is believed to consist of the following 33 U-boats. U-82, U-85, U-132, U-141, U-143, U-147, U-1205, U-1206, U-332, U-352, U-375, U-402, U-431, U-432, U-433, U-451, U-452, U-567, U-568, U-569, U-571, U-572, U-573, U-652, U-654, U-701, U-752, U-753, U-B, U-D-1, U-D-3, U-D-4, U-D-5. <laughs> Section 12. U-Boat Executive Officers. The following table gives the number of executive officers known to be in the U-Boat service on the 1st October 1941. And column lists by approximate age, term, total entry, number trained in U-boats before the war, number trained for naval air service, then a column for total number trained in U-boats up to 1st of October 1941, and U-boat officers dead or captured up to 1st of October 1941. Ages range 38 to 23 years of age. Terms from 1921 listed to 1936. Total entry of officers, 1,382. Total trained in U-boats before the war, 170. Total trained for naval air service, 281. Total number trained in U-boats up to 1st of October 1941, 317. U-boat officers dead or captured up to 1st of October 1941, 93. Note. 1. The executive officers of the 1936 term are now being given commands of U-boats after having served for a short period as first lieutenant. 2. As far as is known, 18 officers have been transferred from the Naval Air Service to U-boats. These have received commands after shorter periods of training than those taken from surface vessels. 3. In addition to the casualties in column 7, 29 executive officers are known to have gone down with U-boats sunk, the names of whom have not yet been ascertained. Section 13. 
U-boat bases and depot ships. Gordenhaven. A prisoner stated that the Germans began laying mines off Gottenhaven three months before starting the Russian campaign, and that naval men stationed there suspected that there was something in the wind involving Russia. In November 1940, a prisoner at the Navigational Petty Officers Training Establishment in Gottenhaven, said to be the only one in Germany, stated that there were then 200 men there, only six of whom, himself included, had previously served in U-boats. Four weeks before the end of the course, 80 men from the 200 were detailed to the U-boat arm. One prisoner from U-570 stated that the aircraft carrier Graf Zeppelin, with the Strength Through Joy ships now being used as depot ships, were in Gottenhaven. Trondheim the U-boat base at Memel and the first training flotilla at Pilau were stated to have been transferred to Tromheim as a protective measure after the declaration of war with Russia. The former bases have since been considered safe, and it has been decided to transfer them to the Baltic again, according to prisoners. The number of active service U-boats at Trondheim was said to vary between 2 and 12. A whole training flotilla was also stated to be based there. All U-boats were described as lying alongside the quay under cover of camouflage nets, which remained in position whether the boats were in harbor or not. No U-boat shelters have been reported. The dock at Trondheim could berth two U-boats at a time. One U-boat was there together with U-501, but her identity number was not established. The Huaskaran a former Hamburg liner of 8,000 tons was stated to be serving as a U-boat tender in the harbor. All final torpedo exercises were said to be carried out in the vicinity of Trondheim before the U-boats proceeded to their operational areas. Despite the fact that the U-boats were protected by large numbers of fighters, Stücke, and reconnaissance squadrons, Trondheim was not considered to be a safe as the French west coast bases, especially as the areas north or south of Iceland were believed to be perilous to U-boats on account of the British aircraft patrols. There appears to be some dissatisfaction in naval circles in Trondheim regarding the spineless attitude of the German naval authorities. Prisoners stated that the Norwegians were asked for a large shed near the wharf. The local people refused so the German Navy built one of their own. Prisoners considered that neither the German Army nor the Air Force would have tolerated the Norwegian refusal, and would have requisitioned the shed without further argument. There were also complaints that naval men were always punished after any disturbance in row in which they had been involved, even if they had been in the right, whereas the Norwegians always got off scot-free. Although it was often they who had provoked the trouble. The German army and air force, on the other hand, would tolerate no nonsense from the local people and invariably backed each other up in punishing the Norwegians. It was stated that when in town, the Germans could walk in pairs, but in the country, they had to be in groups of four or more. At Trondheim, the men employed on the widening of the entrance to the U-boat base being built there were described as skilled workmen who had been called up and put into uniform. The motive behind this conscription was clearly to reduce the expense to the state, as the men received pay as soldiers instead of wages as skilled workmen, and lived in a depot ship. Low Fjord Low Fjord lies about 13 kilometers north of Trondheim. Prisoners stated that many depot ships were lying in this fjord, with troops on board for the protection of Norway against the British invasion, which was expected about four weeks ago. They were described as being moored very close to the shore, camouflaged with paint, and difficult to discern. Ships mentioned as having been there at the same time as the U-501 were the Nisse, Harta, and Black Prince the last of which was used as depot ship by the crew of U-501. Prisoners state that the fjord is closed at night by a very efficient boom defense, 
which even in daytime is only open in certain places. Further protection is afforded by heavy caliber anti-aircraft batteries. All the guns are said to be of the same caliber. Prisoners stated that the 24th U-boat flotilla lay in low fjord. In addition, there were another five active service U-boats. Naval Convalescent Homes It was established that there are two homes for wounded and convalescing naval personnel, one at Krumhubel and the other at Spindermühle. La Palice It appears probable that the administration of the U-boat branch of the Navy at La Palice occupies offices 84 Avenue Guton. Section 14. Cooperation between U-boats and Focke-Wulf Condor aircraft. Prisoners emphasized that there was no direct communication between U-boats and Focke-Wulf Condor aircraft sent on reconnaissance patrols to locate British convoys. According to prisoners, when a Condor sets out, its patrol area and direction finding frequency is signaled to the U-boats by the Vice Admiral U-boats. This signal is repeated at definite times, one of which is believed to be 1400 hours. Upon sighting a convoy, the aircraft begins transmitting DF signals to its base. These signals were stated by prisoners to be either long dashes or a series of Vs. The DF frequency of condors is between 500 and 600 meters, strength of transmission being between 40 and 70 watts. Between signals, the aircraft sends short messages in code, which may either be the course the convoy is steering or the distance and compass bearing of the convoy from the aircraft. On this code, Willy is west, 270 degrees, Sophie is south, 180 degrees, Nani is north, 360 degrees, and Otto is east, 90 degrees. As example, 285 degrees is denoted as 5 Willy 10, the addition of 270, 5, and 10 being 285. Any U-boat picking up these signals transmits their bearing to the Vice Admiral U-boats who, knowing the whereabouts of the U-boats, can calculate the position of the aircraft and convoy by plotting cross bearings. The position of the convoy is then transmitted to the U-boats in the area and necessary dispositions made. The number of ships in convoys and their escorts is not transmitted by condors, presumably because they will return fairly soon to report in full. Prisoners stated that U-boats are equipped with 50 centimeter direction finding loops. U-boats maintain touch with Vice Admiral U-boats on short wavelengths between 20 and 200 meters or on long waves between 16,000 and 21,000 meters. The U-boat power is between 150 and 200 watts. Transmission by U-boats is cut down to a minimum in order that their position should not be located by DF. Of available wavelengths between 20 and 200 meters, only 3 and 4 were said to be generally used. There is a book of frequencies on board for U-boats plotted for months ahead. Changes are usually made each hour, but sometimes the same frequency is retained for two hours running. Apparently, certain frequencies are more favorable for certain times of the day, and consideration is paid to this fact. Section 15. U-Boat Secret Orders The following are items from a volume of secret orders captured on board U-570. Number 1. Timing of salvo firing. Attention is drawn to the fact that an interval of less than 8 seconds is not permitted in salvo firing. Although there is no actual proof of the assumption that the G-7A AZ percussion pistols hitherto in use have detonated together at smaller distances apart than 120 meters, and the consequent damage to torpedoes has hindered results, it is best, in the absence of urgent reasons, not to have an interval of less than 120 meters between torpedoes at the moment of detonation. Number 2. Orders in Code Attention is again drawn to the fact that orders in code 
are not to be issued to boats putting to sea, but officers are to be informed of their contents and meaning. Number 3. Blockade Area 1. The new western limit of the blockade area around England, extended as far from 1st April, is square BE4288 to Anton Jet 3326 to AD 3399. Southern limit for U boat remains 4730 north. 2. For Swedes, Finnish, and Russians, the way is open from AK. 6748 via AL 1489 to AF 4468. These ships are not to be attacked on this route if they are clearly recognized as such. 3. Otherwise, all ships, including USA merchantmen, are to be sunk in the blockade area. Neutral warships are not to be attacked in the blockade area. Number 4. Minimum distance for minesweepers. Sperbrecher. Minimum distance from minesweepers is 150 meters. This must be maintained in all circumstances, even when passing them in harbor. It is particularly necessary to observe this when mooring in the neighborhood of minesweepers, even if Minesweeper's Electric Bow Protection Gear, VES Anlage, is not working. Even in this case, the residual magnetism is sufficient to influence vessels in the vicinity to such an extent that their demagnetization is overpowered. Number 7. Vice Admiral U-Boat's Secret Order 826 of 29th April 1941. As many reports have been received of damage to outer caps of torpedo tubes owing to breakage of protective shutters, some people are of the opinion that a U-boat with an open or leaky outer cap should not be allowed to submerge to maximum depth. This opinion is erroneous. The stability of torpedo tubes against internal pressure is greater than that of the pressure hull against outer pressure. Number 9. Vice Admiral U-Boat's Secret Order 976 of 8th May 1941. The enemy appears to be contemplating the introduction of torpedo nets for merchant vessels at sea. Observations throwing light on this subject must be reported to the Vice Admiral U-Boats on returning from a cruise. Number 10. Radiogram Vice Admiral U-Boats of 17th May 1941. As Germany has considerable interest in the sailing of Swedish, Finnish, and Russian ships through the blockade area, as arranged with her approval, the sinking of these ships must be avoided as far as possible. The course prescribed for these ships may be considered as a strip about 20 nautical miles wide on either side of the central line. Number 11. Vice Admiral U-Boat's Secret Order of 29th May 1941. Resort to arms outside the blockade area north of 4730 North. A. Immediate resort to arms is permitted. 1. In accordance with Standing War Order 101, Paragraph 11, 4B to D and Paragraph 5A to E. 2. Against enemy merchant vessels under neutral escort. B. In the case of warships. 3. By day, attack only if recognized as hostile. For single warships, steaming without lights, are only to be attacked if they are definitely recognized as enemy warships or have opened hostilities. 5. Warships steaming without lights in defense of convoys may be attacked if the situation demands it. Number 12. Vice Admiral U-Boats of 3rd June 1941. 1. The risk of giving away bearings by short signal and wireless messages is so great at present that commanding officers must always consider whether they are actually necessary and in accordance with operational orders. 2. In or near areas of our own U-boat positions, the use of wireless telegraph must be even further restricted. Only tactically 
necessary wireless telegraph messages and short signals should be sent out. Number 13. Vice Admiral U-Boats of 1st June 1941. In contradiction to previous orders, the following regulations for passage through the North Sea come into force at once. Remain invisible. For this purpose, boats may proceed on the surface only at night during the winter. In the summer, for the sake of speed, they may surface by day so long as the horizon and sky are clear, or clouds high, so that surprise is impossible. Proceed submerged at dusk. Number 14. Vice Admiral U-Boats, Secret 1155 of 17th May, 1941. Repetition of number 10. Number 16. Concerning officers' financial affairs. The Defense Station in War Area X reports the following in a letter. Almost all officers living at Weitzel's Hotel in Hamburg are short of money. Most of them bank at Almen's Bank Kiel and are paying at present by uncovered checks. Almen does not return these checks to drawer, but covers them in course of time by the payments automatically coming in. This report affords a most unpleasant insight into the financial transactions of a number of officers appointed to the U-boat branch. Every U-boat officer must regulate his money affairs in accordance with the tradition obtaining in the officer's corps. It is unworthy of an officer and an offense against the law to make payment by uncovered checks. If a boat is lost, such checks might under certain conditions be returned to drawer, dishonored, and most disagreeable consequences would ensue for the family or the officer taken prisoner. An officer must be an example to his subordinates and all his compatriots in the management of his finances. An officer transgressing these principles endangers the reputation of the officer's corps among the general public. An officer who tenders worthless checks renders himself guilty of deception or fraud. In future, I shall call any officer to account most severely who offends against this prohibition. This order must be made known to all subordinate officers on the April and 1st October of each year. All officers and midshipmen entering the U-boat service must be informed of this order separately in the U-boat training divisions. Number 17. Vice Admiral U-Boats, Secret Order of 12th May, 1941. On account of inquiries, identification marks of our own naval forces for the benefit of our own aircraft at present valid are herewith made known again. Ships and boats. Gun turrets and gun shields, painted bright yellow, swastika flag on fore and aft decks. Vessels without gun turrets or gun shields, only the swastika flag. War vessels without war paint and U-boats, no identification marks. Number 19. Telegram, Vice Admiral U-boats of 18th June 1941. 1. Contrary to previous procedure, from now onwards, position data according to reference points will always be given in such a way that the reference point is calculated from the position ordered, in the direction indicated, as with position data with regard to landmarks. 2. Boats are not to give their position according to reference points, but by squares, as hitherto. Number 20. Wireless Telegraph. Vice Admiral U-Boats of 24th June 1941. Russian and former Baltic ships are enemy, with the exception of Finnish. Immediate resort to arms is permitted against them. Number 21. Vice Admiral U-Boats Secret Order of 27th June 1941. 1. The following wireless telegraph message is by way of correction of mistakes made and was sent by Vice Admiral U-Boats on 27th June to all boats at sea. Wireless telegraph, Vice Admiral U-Boats, all U-Boats, mistakes made recently. 
one U two zero three wireless telegraph twenty 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 four keeping touch was imperative for the other boat's sake. If return was absolutely necessary, touch with enemy position and course of convoy should at least have been reported immediately before starting home. Two U seventy nine wireless telegraph O five two O slash twenty seven boat should have continued to keep touch with the enemy for the relief of other boats. Having only forty two cubic meters of fuel did not necessitate return. three U sixty nine wireless telegraph O three O one slash twenty seven If impossible to keep in touch any longer on account of fuel, latest position and course of convoy should at least have been reported. two this reproof was occasioned by the following circumstances. A. U-203 was the only boat to be in touch with an outward-bound convoy. Close by and some distance away, there were a number of boats which might have operated successfully in this area. U-203 started home without reporting the latest position of the enemy. B. U-79, standing by a convoy not yet properly reported, started home with 42 cubic meters of fuel, without any apparently urgent reason for doing so. C. U-68, when short of fuel, was in touch with a convoy proceeding in the same direction as herself, and sank two steamers belonging to it. She had orders to report touch with the enemy, to U-123 stationed nearby, so long as fuel supply would allow. She did not keep touch, did not report whether this was due to lack of fuel, and did not report latest position and course of convoy. Number 23, Wireless Telegraph, Vice Admiral U-Boats of 11th July, 1941. 1. Swedish ships clearly showing their distinguishing marks must be spared not only on the route already laid down, but when they deviate from it at 62 degrees north, negative 13 degrees west, and thence east or west via 62 degrees north, negative 3 degrees east, towards Skagarak. They must therefore not be attacked within a circumference of 60 nautical miles around the Faroes, even if they deviate from this route so long as they are recognized. Germany's interest in this traffic is considerable. Reporting will be attempted, apart from 2144-11-131, but it is not assured. 2. At present, on their way eastwards, SS Svendrot, Brazil, and Saturnus. Section 16. General Remarks Regarding U-Boats Allocation of Operation Areas According to one prisoner, U-Boats do not remain indefinitely in the operational square or area originally allotted to them. A time limit is set for their stay in any one particular square, and after this has expired, they are moved to further squares at the discretion of the Vice Admiral U-Boats. Increased difficulties of attack. Prisoners expressed the opinion that the occupation of Iceland by British and later American forces was playing a big part in the defeat of the U boat arm. They stated that improved and convoying of merchant ships had also increased the difficulties of successful attack, and that the presence of protecting aircraft over a convoy was a danger signal that the Germans could not ignore. It forced them to break off an attack and make good their escape. Avoiding of aircraft by U-boats A petty officer prisoner stated that after diving to avoid aircraft, U-boats were instructed to proceed away from the locality at full speed. This prisoner added that British air reconnaissance was particularly dreaded by U-boats. He said, if on the surface you see a plane, the plane has probably seen you, and it is already too late. You are done. Diving Angle of U-Boats Prisoners stated 
that the diving angle was usually 3 degrees to 4 degrees, but when crash diving, it was 15 degrees to 20 degrees according to the state of the sea. They dived more steeply in bad weather. German Depth Charges A prisoner who had seen service in a German submarine chaser stated that the depth charges used against Allied submarines were 550 pounds in weight. They could be set to detonate at depths of 30, 60, 90, or 120 meters. Conditions of service in U-boats A prisoner alleged that it was no longer possible for U-boat personnel to apply for transfer from the U-boat service. This particular man had applied to be sent to a petty officer's training course for destroyers. He had had previous experience of U-boats and was most unwilling to even go in one again. His application was refused. Three days before he was available for transfer, he was told that he had been drafted to the first U-boat flotilla. Another prisoner stated that the majority of U-boat crews now operating had been given no option about going into the U-boat arm, particularly if they had special qualifications. Awards to U-boat crews A prisoner stated that U-boat personnel who had spent 24 days at sea on a war cruise or who had fallen into the hands of the enemy following the sinking of their U-boats qualified for the special U-boat badge. U-boat men who were lost with their boats were posthumously awarded the Iron Cross Second Class and the U-Boat Badge. Section 17 Other Ships Torpedo Boat Lux A Chief Petty Officer prisoner from U-570 said that the torpedo boat Lux had been rammed in Wilhelmshaven and had sunk. In order to keep this fact dark, Another torpedo boat was named Lux, but the incident became an open secret after four weeks. Submarine Chaser Flotilla A petty officer prisoner from U-570 stated that he had served for one year in a submarine chaser flotilla. He joined this flotilla on February or March 1940. On 21st March 1940, while his boat was at Borkum with three others, they were attacked by British aircraft. Their anti-aircraft gun jammed. Four bombs were dropped, three to port, and one starboard of his boat, no hits being scored. On 20th April 1940, the prisoner's flotilla, this time with five boats, was used to escort two transports from Friedrichshaven to Oslo. The first ship carried light motor vehicles, and the second ammunition, there being troops in both. Off the entrance to Oslo Fjord, the prisoner alleged, the convoy was attacked by a British submarine. Four torpedoes were fired, all of which missed. One torpedo passed eight yards ahead, and one five yards astern of the submarine chaser, lettered E, in the flotilla. According to the prisoner, on 23rd March 1940, the flotilla of five boats was attacked again off the Swedish coast by a submarine. A direct hit was scored on boat B of the flotilla, which exploded and sank within a minute. Of the crew of 30, only four men were saved, one of these dying later. Above 100 depth charges were dropped over the estimated position of the submarine, and it was believed she was destroyed. In July 1940, the prisoner stated, Flotilla Boat D was mined off Trondheim, 13 men being killed, while Flotilla Boat Number 126 was torpedoed off the island of Shermanikug, 9 men being killed. During this month, July 1940, the prisoner's boat was in Emden, apparently for refitting. On one night, there was an air raid as a result of which there were six fatal casualties in the town. On 23rd July 1940, the prisoner's flotilla proceeded to Den Helder, 28 mines being sighted and sunk on the way. The prisoner observed that the town had suffered much damage, the hospital being completely wrecked. 
On 29th July 1940, the flotilla attempted to bring in a Dutch survey vessel which had had to anchor in the heavy seas off Norderney on account of engine trouble. On 14th August 1940, five boats of the flotilla were alleged by the prisoner to have had a brush with two British destroyers north of Texel. One boat was hit, one man being killed and five wounded. The boat was not sunk and the flotilla put into Borkum. Schwan A petty officer, telegraphist prisoner who had joined the German Navy some years before the war, stated that two weeks before the war broke out, he was summoned to Wilhelmshaven Schlittau. Here he and a number of other telegraphists, who had also been summoned, were given 50 Reichsmarks, each to provide themselves with civilian clothing. The party was then split into four sections, one being sent to Hamburg, and one to Stetten, and one to Bremen, while one remained in Schlittau. The prisoner was with the Hamburg party. They were met at Hamburg station at midnight by a lieutenant of the Naval Reserve, who was also in civilian clothes. They were then taken on board a cargo liner, which the prisoner alleged was the Schwan, belonging to the Alkborg line. The ship left Hamburg at 0400 that night and proceeded to cruise off the Skagerrak and the southwestern coast of Norway. The object of the cruise was to spy out the movements of British and Allied shipping and the wireless traffic in English between the ships. The prisoner stated that his ship scarcely ever flew the German flag and her name had been deliberately defaced so that it was practically illegible. The ship was not armed and was not of more than 3,000 tons. German Hospital Ship a prisoner from U-570 stated that a British submarine had sunk a German hospital ship off the Norwegian coast shortly before U-570 sailed on her first and last war cruise on 23rd August 1941. Blücher An officer prisoner stated that the captain of the cruiser Blücher was killed in an aircraft accident eight days after the cruiser was sunk during the Norwegian campaign. Section 18. Miscellaneous Conditions of Service in the German Navy A prisoner signed on in the Navy in 1933 for four and a half years, but when his promotion to petty officer was due, a new order came into force which extended his service to twelve years. If he wished to be promoted, he had no other option but to comply. Some men having signed on for four and a half years were called to their divisional officers after two years' service and were asked to sign on, extending their period of service to fifteen years. Most of them did so. Those who had refused found written on their discharge papers at the expiration of their four and a half years, left the fatherland in the hour of need. Verlist das Vaterland und schwerste Not. This remark effectively prevented them from obtaining any form of employment in civilian life and acted as a warning to other men who might have been tempted to refuse the conditions of service. A prisoner repeated the phrase several times, Once the Navy gets you, you're finished. Several prisoners expressed extreme bitterness about the lack of prospects for naval men at the expiration of their service compared to the Army or Air Force. The latter services afford good educational courses, enabling men to pass various examinations which assure them well-paid jobs in the civil service and other walks of life. A similar experiment was tried in the Navy and was dropped because it was found seriously to interfere with naval duties. The prospects of adequate jobs on leaving the Navy are scarce, and some men think themselves lucky if they can succeed in finding even a humble job, such as being in charge of a ferry boat in Keel Harbor, which one chief petty officer of 15 years' service cited as the best job for which he could reasonably hope. 
There is also dissatisfaction amongst reservists who have been recalled to the Navy. On returning to the service, many have not been given their former rating, but have been compelled to accept considerably lower ranks. The pomposity of officials who incur expense and waste to satisfy ideals of their own dignity and importance has also caused considerable indignation. A typical instance was cited when U-570 was lying at the Tirpitz Mall in U-Boat Acceptance Committee consisting of three officials insisted on waiting at the Blucher Bridge for the U-Boat to be brought to them. It would have been no trouble whatsoever for them to take the ferry to the U-Boat. The time wasted and the unnecessary trouble of moving the U-Boat caused strong feeling among the ship's company. A petty officer prisoner stated that there was much bad feeling in the German Navy concerning the better treatment of members of the German Air Force. Living conditions were particularly bad for the Navy in barracks and in depot ships, while in hostile ships there was scarcely room to sling a hammock. He quoted a saying common among naval circles that today it was the Prussian Army, the Imperial Navy, and the National Socialist Air Force implying that the latter service was the most favored arm, while the navy, like the other formerly imperial institutions, was obsolete and neglected. Manning Divisions A prisoner stated that the Manning Division, Schiff Stammabteilung, formerly stationed at Gluckstadt, had been moved to Holland. The 6th Manning Division had also been moved to Holland, but had later been transferred to Pilau. The 8th Manning Division had been moved to France, and another supplying personnel for North Sea warships had been established near Paris. Naval Barracks at Buxtehude Several prisoners from the U-570 stated that in October 1940, a new naval barracks was being built at Buxtehude near Hamburg, they were under the impression that it was to be one of the most comfortable and up-to-date training establishments in Germany. Training of Naval Telegraphists Describing the training of naval telegraphists, a petty officer telegraphist stated that he was two years at sea before being drafted to a special petty officer telegraphist training school. The periods of two years preliminary training was remarkably short and ratings generally considered themselves lucky if they were drafted to the school after three years' service. The course at the school lasted for one year, after which the trainees were required to send and receive 110 letters per minute. The final test lasted for three minutes and had to be passed without mistake. Obscenity Among the personal property captured from U-570, were a number of parodies, skits, and poems, all of an unrelievably coarse and obscene nature, there being scarcely a single redeeming witty phrase in the whole. A strong undercurrent of unashamed blasphemy was apparent, and may well be a result of modern Hitler youth training. Anti-aircraft guns on Norwegian coast. Germany was stated by one prisoner to have mounted a vast number of anti-aircraft guns along the Norwegian coast, making the approach of hostile aircraft from the sea suicidal. Norwegian and Dutch Workmen Prisoners indicated that the German authorities were sorely troubled by the attitude of Norwegian workmen in occupied ports in Norway. It had been found necessary to forbid Norwegians to go on board German U-boats, and acts of sabotage had been constantly occurred. It was now arranged that should it be necessary to employ a Norwegian workman in a German ship, he should be attended by a German guard. Dutch workmen were stated by one prisoner to be even more antagonistic than the Norwegians, and in his opinion, they were far too mildly treated. Interference in Industry by Party Officials According to a prisoner, German industries were being greatly impeded by the interference of party officials 
empower to enforce government decrees and orders. These men did not properly understand their work and they were constantly causing difficulties, particularly in regards to the distribution of skilled labor. The prisoner stated that Hitler was too busy to devote any time to such matters and that the only man who could have straightened things out satisfactorily was Rudolf Hess. Air raid damage in German ports. Prisoners gave the usual conflicting statements regarding air raid damage in German ports. Prisoners who alleged they had been present during large-scale raids in Kiel, Hamburg, and Bremen affected to depreciate the damage, but admitted that they had been badly shaken. One prisoner stated that the damage at Kiel was not really bad, but another prisoner who was present at a big raid on this port described parts of the town as being enveloped in a veritable sea of flame. The Holstenwall and the Deutsche Ring were described as having been severely bombed, anti-aircraft batteries along the Deutsche Ring being entirely destroyed. An old story was repeated by prisoners that unexploded bombs dropped on Bremen and Hamburg were found to contain sand and chalk. Electrification of Berlin-Hamburg Railway A prisoner stated that the railway line between Berlin and Hamburg was being electrified. Services Information Bureau in Rome It was established that on 13th March 1941, a German Services Information Bureau was established in Rome at the Hotel Nuevo Roma Via Regina Giovanni di Bulgaria 3, telephone 43751. All officers of the three services are required to report there on arrival in Rome. Billeting, welfare, and numerous other arrangements are all undertaken by the center. Each mainline train arriving in Rome is met by a representative from his organization who collects together all officers and men and conducts them to the Hotel Nueva Roma. Soldiers arriving at the smaller railway stations have to report to the local NSDAP or Nazi party representative who directs them to the information centre. Men on leave have still to report to the senior officer of their service in Rome. Officers and men are responsible for their own accommodation and are allowed to stay only at hotels which have been taken over by the military authorities. Appendix List of crew of U-570 Column by name, rank, English equivalent, age, etc. Total crew, four officers, 14 petty officers, 25 men, total 43.